So welcome everybody. I'm going to spend less time than usual up here and thank Conical Phillips for supporting this series, but I also have somebody else to help. Um, you will see that this year is the year of collaboration. And this event in particular, uh, we're collaborating with the Hunter Hub for Entrepreneurial Thinking. Have you guys heard of that hub? Has anybody heard of that hub? Excellent. So a big thank you because uh, today we're co-sponsored in bringing our speaker to come and uh, share his knowledge with you all. And that uh, goes out a big thanks to the Hub and to their executive director, Kimberly Newtons. Is she here today? I know she's going to step in. She was just on the side a few minutes ago. OK. So um, you will see a couple of things on uh, your cards that's new. We have a, a little card that alludes to the indigenous strategy that was done at the university, uh, which we have received a beautiful Blackfoot name for, Itapotop. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. This session uh, couldn't have happened uh, without the collaboration of Dr. David Lertzman. So I'm going to pass uh, the microphone over to him. If you don't know him, he um, is one of our great champions from Haskane in the indigenous strategy work that was done at the University of Calgary. Uh, he's worked with indigenous peoples for over 20 years, and he's most well known for his wilderness retreat and expedition. Uh, please welcome Dr. David Lertzman that will introduce our speaker today. Uh, Oki Niksukua Taniko uh, David Lertzman. I'm Boa Stitch, David Lertzman. I'm yet, I'm a Haskane faculty member and very grateful to be here today to uh, introduce dear colleague um, Rick Colburn. I'd like to recognize that Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary is in the traditional territories of Treaty 7 First Nations, including the Blackfoot Nations, Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai, as well as the Stony Nakoda people, Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Wesley, and also the Tsutuna people. And this, is, this area of Calgary is the region of uh, Métis Nation of Alberta, Treaty 3. Calgary uh, is a pretty new name. So if you look in the languages of this area, you'll learn that the name of this place in Blackfoot is Mohkintsis and Wichispa Oyade in, uh, in Nakoda. And it refers to the elbow. It refers to the elbow. And in these places where rivers come together, so we have the elbow and the, the bow, important things occur in these ecologically significant areas, often places where people meet to gather and discuss important things, which is what we're going to be doing here today. Um, we have been working on indigenous strategy here, here at the University of Calgary for close to two years. And it's been a, a privilege for me, a, a signal honor and a pinnacle achievement in my career to be able to be a part of that. The, um, the University of Calgary, uh, we, we're kind of latecomers to this dance of indigenous strategy. And in, in British Columbia, they're so far ahead of us that you know, we, we, we look forward to having their problems. Um, but here, if, if we are able to achieve what the elders have, have told us to do uh, in working with them, we, they have also told us we could be set to jump to the head of the pack. And so that's a, that's a great inspiration for us. The name that we were given for the indigenous strategy, Mohkintsis, uh, sorry, um, Itapatop, uh, when I spoke with Andy Blackwater on the day that that name was given, he described it a as a physical place on the land, somewhere on Mother Earth that you go to to get um, revitalized and rejuvenated uh, to complete your life's journey. So they're telling us this is what the university could be. And, and we probably have a, a long ways to go to get there because most of the time students come here and get stressed out. So we're not quite at the... <laughs> at the, you know, soothe you down and, and uh, beef you up, but we're working on it. Um, and at Haskane, we've been working in this field for a while, uh, but now with the Etapotope, we are set to harmonize all of our efforts and implement that strategy as a long-term project that will hopefully shift the culture of academia on the road to reconciliation. And part of that is bringing out people like Rick, 
I met Rick a few years ago when we were looking for guidance and support in working with Aboriginal business students here at Haskane. And uh, I was basically sent by the students <laughs> to have coffee with Rick. And I, and I learned um, th that Rick had already been working on these projects and created tremendous opportunities through the Chinook Scholars Program in British Columbia. And working together, we were able to extend that here to Alberta. So it's the only Alberta program of Chinook Scholars. Out it's the only program outside of BC. And in, in the years that I've gotten to know Rick, I've always been amazed at how he is on the leading edge of the leading edge. So Rick, I'm aware that Rick comes from the uh, North Bay, Mattawa, Mattawa North Bay Algonquian. Um, he holds a PhD from Cambridge and um, I'm an MBA from SFU. And um, Rick is, is actively teaching in the area of indigenous entrepreneurship, business strategy, international business in both indigenous and non-indigenous programs. So he is a living example of what we're actually trying to achieve. He's that living bridge. And, um, and I, it just gives me tremendous pleasure and honor to be able to call Rick forward. He's the first Fulbright scholar in indigenous entrepreneurship. He was the first associate dean of uh, indigenous business in Canada. So it's a great opportunity to uh, have Rick here at Haskane. Thank you, Rick. All right, well, thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, you know, and, and, and thanks for looking after me, uh, Chell and uh, David and David, David, and, and thanks for being here. Now, I don't feel like I'm an expert at anything, so when I was thinking about how to do this, this, this project, I thought that what I would talk to you about is what my journey was and some of my concerns and how I thought about um, how we think about indigenous, indigenous entrepreneurship and how we think about teaching it. And so a lot of this is going to come by in terms of what my experience was, and I'm going to frame it in some ways around that. And then I'm going to talk about that shift and how I've been starting to rethink entrepreneurship from an indigenous perspective. Does that work for you guys? Yeah, right, <laughs> okay. So my background, sorry, before we get started, you know, my background is, uh, uh, I was director of Chinook. Um, that was a, a, a provincial initiative where we brought high school students together, um, university students who are studying business all across the province, and then we worked with senior indigenous leaders as well. And then I've also worked in other ways in terms of community. So, so there's a, a lot of components that I'm bringing here through that experience. And this is one cohort of Chinook scholars who are graduating on that day. So as we kind of get started, what I'd like you to do is just think about three questions as, as I'm walking through this. The first is, what is Indigenous entrepreneurship and what does that mean? Um, you know, because we all have sent a sense of what entrepreneurship is and we have different ways of thinking about entrepreneurship. So what is it that makes entrepreneurship Indigenous from your perspective? And I'm going to talk from my perspective. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the things we can think about. The other one is, how is entrepreneurship enacted by Indigenous peoples? How does that happen? And how do we think about that in terms of how we engage in entrepreneurship? And maybe the third thing you can be thinking about is, why think about Indigenous entrepreneurship as hybrid value creation? And that's what I'm going to be kind of talking about, is really thinking about it as hybrid ventures and that we're creating hybrid ventures. And part of that for me is around reframing and rethinking what entrepreneurship is. And so I'm going to walk through that. Does that make sense? All right. So here's what we're going to do today. Quickly, I'm going to start with a story. And the story is just around one example of, a, of an indigenous entrepreneurial activity that's very famous in Canada, that's growing significantly. Then I want to step back for a second and think about colonialism and reconciliation and, and just think about how does that, how did, how have I thought about that? How does that impact me? And how did that send me in the direction that, I, that I've gone in terms of reframing this? And then what I'm going to do is share around Indigenous entrepreneurship as hybrid venture creation and what that means and what that looks like. And we'll walk through a bit of a framework that I've developed. And my perspective on that is it's a framework that we can think about it from inside a community and how we're doing entrepreneurship, but it's also a framework that, that people from outside these communities can think about how do we understand an Indigenous entrepreneurship in a community that you may be working with. Because there's diversity across communities. Not every community is the same, but so how do we start framing around 
an approach or thinking around that. And then we're just going to close in terms of returning to that. So that's how I'd like to go today. So the stories around Manitoba Mucklucks, a very, very famous company, right? And Sean McCormick is Métis, said, I dream of a day when we're not a business, help a community, but rather a community helping ourselves. We'll continue to build the dream of, of building a vibrant global brand that Aboriginal people can feel proud of and be part of. It's quite a powerful statement. And in lots of ways, as an Indigenous entrepreneur, he's already framing how to understand what hybrid venture creation is. It's around having pride and around building a business that's within that community, part of that community, and inside of that. So Manitoba mucklucks, it's Indigenous owned. It's a Canadian footwear for those people who haven't heard it or who haven't been wearing the mucklucks. Um, widely acclaimed for innovative designs, but it emphasizes its mission to support Indigenous entrepreneurs or artisans and Indigenous people and the community within, its, within where it's operating, particularly in Manitoba, but also in Canada. So McCormick grew up, was working in the community. His whole idea around the business came out of his experiences growing up in that community and drew on the culture and drew on his experiences. And so he describes uh, Manitoba Mucklucks as a private business that's almost a social venture. So in other words, he's describing what a hybrid venture is. It's a business, it's a private business, or it can be a community business that's almost a social venture. So what's key about Manitoba, I'll just speak over it. What's key about it is that Manitoba Mucklucks as, as an indigenous company is drawing on its roots. It's drawing on the strengths of community. And while they're doing that, they're giving back to community. They're hiring indigenous peoples on the management side. They're hiring indigenous peoples as designers. They're hiring people to make those products. So it's very key. And it's being sold from an, as an indigenous entrepreneurial product. So it's important. So if we think about just a quick start, hybrid ventures, they seek to address a community's complex social issues on some level, right? A socioeconomic challenges or objectives and whatever those are. Now, the reason I want to talk about that from, and this will become clearer later, as not a social entrepreneurship, because I think we need to shift that frame. And we need to talk about this as hybrid venture creation. So it's about prioritizing, balancing, and blending social, cultural, economic, environmental, spiritual, whatever those values are that are important to the community that you're working in or that are important to the broader community that you're a part of. And so that's a key component of hybrid ventures. So they hire indigenous people in the management, the manufacturing, the creative design. Um, they provide annual bursaries. This is how they give back to their community. Um, they, they provide bursaries for finance students and business students. But not only that, it's around cultural revitalization. So they're looking at uh, how do we start teaching our youth? How do we bring elders and youth and our artisans together to start revitalizing their culture? So in a lot of ways, they're not a backward-looking business. They're looking at let's revitalize culture, but let's bring it into the 21st century. And then how do we start building that out in terms of our communities? And how does that promote revitalization and cultural rebirth in the communities? So indigenous elders and artisans teach, they share around the beading and the leather skills and how we make these mucklucks. They also have an e-commerce site. And the e-commerce site's important because it's a site that any artisan can put up their wares and sell. And Manitoba mucklucks does not take any of that. 100% goes to the artist. So again, it's a way for them to support this. And these are some of the ways, from my perspective, that they're defined as a hybrid venture. And well, again, we'll talk a bit more about that later. So they, in, in, in a way, this company exemplifies some trends around global in, uh, uh, indigenous entrepreneurship. You know, they're drawing on tradition and culture. They're pursuing social, spiritual, environmental, and or cultural. It can be a mixture of different values, depending on the community they're coming out of, um, or depending on what's important in terms of the work that they're doing. Fundamentally, they're, they've, they're, they're working on economic value creation to sustain the business and keep the business moving forward but they're thinking about ways to contribute back to community. And depending on the type of hybrid venture, it can be as passive as supporting, supporting spa, um, bursaries, supporting students, or as, as active as 
fundamentally driving the venture to drive culture, driving the venture to derive those values that are important to the community, where economics sort of take a little bit of a backseat to that, and it's not foregrounded. So I want to now just kind of step back and talk about the kind of decolonization and, and this path to reconciliation. And this, again, this comes through my experience around walk, walking through the work that I've been doing and my, my experiences around that. So JP Gladue, who's uh, the head of the CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, uh, said that we can't reverse 100 years of unequal relationships overnight that the history of broken treaties, territorial dispossession, reserves and residential schools will take time to overcome. It'll take time and it'll, it'll take work. Um, and what's important about this is that economic reconciliation comes through some of the work that we can do from an, a hybrid venture creation perspective. Now, um, some of the people that, are, that are, I think are important to that discussion are Marie Baptiste, uh, Taiki Alfred, there's a lot of great indigenous scholars who are coming and, and speaking up to that. Uh, I'll start by saying colonization and decolonization is contested. We, we, it's very much a contested term in, in terms of how we understand it, how that kind of functions, what it looks like, but how, so how do we get out of that? How do we start to break those, those uh, worldviews that are colonial worldviews? And so, I'm going to give you my perspective and my, kind of my thinking around that, but remember, it's a contested term. There's a lot of different ways to start thinking about that. But the key is, from my perspective, is that uh, uh, colonialism relates to Eurocentrism, right? So assuming and not even realizing or having the awareness that um, there's superiority and primacy of Western perspectives, that we're not even aware that we're functioning in the world in which the assumption is that Western is right and anything else that's alternative is not so right or doesn't have a legitimate place in terms of our thinking or in terms of how we act or how we move. And we're not always aware of that and we're not always clear that that's what's happening. We're not always clear that we're being privileged or we have privileges because of colonial activities that happened in the past or are still happening. So the key is that uh, Eurocentrism and colonialism impacts all parts of our lives. It packs us in the academy, in the university, and packs us when we're out in the world. Um, both from an indigenous and a non-indigenous perspective, we're all subject to what's happened from, from a colonization perspective, right? So key here is that success is just, uh, defined from that perspective. So it's defined as assimilation to dominant Eurocentric values, I, norms, and languages. It's not defined as, as having an alternative view, right? Um, it privileges colonial cultures, the structures that we see around us. It privileges languages and protocols and knowledge practices. How we engage in the world, it has impact. It's eroded co collective cultures through privileging individualism in schools and society and through privileging big K knowledge, big T truth, whatever those things are. And it has eroded indigenous languages and associated worldviews cosmologies, epistemologies, and spiritualities. And so how do we start to bring that back in? How do we start to revitalize that from our perspective around, around reconciliation and decolonization? Right? So for me, Eurocentrism is enacted through colonization. And we can see that businesses followed colonial actions, right? Businesses colonized right behind the colonizers. And so it's, it, it's always been in lockstep, right? But ultimately, when we're looking at colonialism, it's an act of control over an appropriation of indigenous peoples and their lands. It's a suppression of language. It's a suppression of practices. It's embedded in the everyday practices, the everyday things that we do in our lives here today. And we're all impacted by that, we're all of us here in this room. We've had even more acts of uh, legislative acts and policies that have asserted and legitimized those views in much harder in a much more direct way and that have put those Western intellectual uh, and economic perspectives to the fore. We've privileged settlement through the displacement of individual indigenous peoples from traditional lands. We made, we carved space out for settlers to colonize the space that was indigenous territories. So we need to think about that and what that means. We delegitimized, we excluded and we suppressed indigenous rights, indigenous I, notions of sovereignty, culture, knowledge, 
knowing and spirituality. So how do we move forward on that? How do we start to think about that? One way is to start getting that awareness, start understanding those dynamics, how we are in the world and how we walk in the world, and how do we start moving and pushing against colonization. So the consequences for indigenous peoples, physically, politically, and socially relegated to the margins. We don't have opportunities to participate because the opportunities aren't there. We're not even in the game. Or we weren't even allowed to get out to get in the game. So we need to shift that, right? Indigenous voices and ideas were silenced, they were delegitimized, they were excluded. So how do we start to bring that back in? How do we start to bring that into business? How do we start to bring that back into education? How do we re-legitimize that? And then we excluded and constrained indigenous people from actually participating and being part of these things. In the legal, the political, the social, and in business practices, we didn't let them participate. We couldn't be a part of that. And so we now have an opportunity to turn that around and to try to change that, right? So decolonization requires imagination, collaboration and inclusion, and replacement of the equitable status quo with a concrete set of acceptable liberatory alternatives. So we need to think about how we're gonna walk in the world and how can we do this? Because all of us have to kind of walk that walk. All of us have to understand it and figure it out for ourselves. We need to come to that place. And we, we need to do what we're comfortable with. And those steps are important. So if we look at decolonization, some of the imperatives that I, I, I think are important is to identify and strive to overcome colonial mindsets, see what they are, understand what they are, what do they mean. Develop an awareness and a critique of Eurocentric cultural bias and those kind of racialized negative discourses. How do we get past that? A certain defend the integrity of indigenous rights in this country and in globally and what that means in terms of the legal, political, and educational practices that we're a part of. And then examining and critiquing the laws, you know, the Constitution, the Indian Act, policies and history, and different, you know, the differential treatment and resources that uh, were the case for indigenous peoples. And address intergenerational trauma, assimilation, and these loss of languages. Because culture and language are key. And culture and how we see the world and language is key. So protect and defend indigeneity, ensure that indigenous ways of knowing and doing are, re are revived and valued and celebrated. And reconsider individual, the whole individualistic nature of skills and capacities from a collective perspective. So what does that mean in terms of balancing the collective with the individualistic? What does that mean? How can we act on that? How can we act that in our daily lives? How can we act on that from an institutional perspective, from education? All of these are important pieces. So for me, some of the things that, that, that I thought were challenging was working in business schools is that one, there was a chronic lack of indigenous business faculty. There were no indigenous faculty members and still aren't in many universities who can speak to this or have this experience or have that understanding or can step in both worlds. It's important that we have indigenous people in our communities, in, in, in these educational institutions, in these areas. Hiring practices actively marginalize indigenous candidates. They're filtered out. They're filtered out because they have different backgrounds, different experiences. They may have engaged in community too much and not done enough of the, the writing the, the articles. There's lots of ways that people get marginalized through this. And then non-indigenous faculty are unaware and many times disinterested in the issues of colonization, decolonization, and reconciliation. And so from a faculty perspective and an education perspective, how do we turn that around? How do we get faculty to be interested in that? How do we get faculty to understand how to bring that into the classroom and how to engage with our students? Important work. Um, the other side is I found that there were unreflective approaches to teaching business and entrepreneurship in particular. And when I was looking at how do we teach business and how do we teach entrepreneurship, I became worried about that. I became worried because I felt we were recolonizing our students. We were bringing them back into this Eurocentric view using the constructs and language of business that were unicentric, Eurocentric. So how do we change that? 
And that was a challenge for me, and that, that's something that came out of my work with Chinook, came out of the work that I've done as, as a dean, came out of the work that I've been doing since then. It's how do we start rethinking these things to at least get us walking into that, that direction. So my concern was business schools were actively recolonizing and assimilating indigenous business students in these worldviews and pulling away from some of their traditional view, worldviews and pulling them away from this, the notion of the collective back into that individual profit-making economic person walking the land. So how, for me, was how do I decolonize the notion of entrepreneurship to act on reconciliation? And so that kind of drove my thinking. So Grand Chief Ed John, uh, who we worked with in terms of Chinook, he said it's very clear to, to the First Nations Leadership Council that focusing on economic development by itself does not pave the road to self-reliance. However, when economic development is combined with strong business education, then we have the equation that equals indigenous success. So part of that for us is around how do we change the frames? How do we start thinking from an indigenous perspective and how do we bring indigenous ideas into the business school? I'm very excited about University of Calgary and the work that they're doing. Um, I've, I've read through the strategy and I've read through the work that you're doing and I, all I can say is what a great start. I think that the work that's gone in there, you should be applauding the, 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 the team that put this together because I think it's a really good start in terms of starting to walk that walk and to figure it out as an institution. So, so congratulations to Calgary in terms of doing that, right? It's a really great start. In terms of the work that I'm doing, in terms of the calls to action, typically I would kind of attach it to 62, 63. So how to integrate into indigenous knowledge and teaching methods into classrooms, so how do I teach? How do I think about teaching? But it's not only with indigenous students, but how do I do that with non-indigenous students? And how do I think about okay, bringing in, in, in indigenous knowledge, not as a kind of exotic or as a special thing, but how do I integrate it into how we're thinking about business and what we're trying to do? And then call to action 63, how do we build student capacity for intercultural understanding, for creating empathy and mutual respect? And that's how we walk that walk, that's how we integrate some of that knowledge and knowing, and that's how we think about we, working with students, both indigenous and non-indigenous, working with communities. So for me, one of the, the, the themes around how I work and how I teach is around empathy and community. So what's important when we're doing business is how do we think about that from a, the perspective of empathy, and how do we think about that from the perspective of community? Community is the, it can be the business, it can be the community that the business is in. These communities are important. And how do we engage with that? And how do we think about that? And then the call to action 92 is around how do we build respectful relationships and obtaining around free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples before proceeding with economic development projects and provide education for management and staff. And I think the key is how do we start creating models and ways of thinking for our corporate partners, for the companies that want to engage? How do we help them be authentic around that engagement or understand the ways to engage around that? So those are some of the things that are driving what I'm doing. So I just want to walk into uh, this uh, notion of indigenous entrepreneurship and hybrid venture creation. So if you look at kind of the Western Eurocentric view of entrepreneurship, it's around discovery of opportunities creation of new economic activities, profit for the entrepreneur. Many times it's the entrepreneur's heroic figure. You know, these are our rock stars. Uh, and very much ecocentric. Everything is framed within that eco e economic model, whatever that is, the business model. How are we going to make model? How are we going to put profits, right? So if we look at that, Euro Eurocentric perspective is privilege. Entrepreneurship language that frames worldviews that are defined as dominant ways of thinking. There's one way to do business. There's one way to be an entrepreneur. The successful entrepreneur makes lots of money and built a great big organization that they can sell. But there are other ways to think about entrepreneurship. You know, the economic-centric framework focuses on profits, shareholder value, competition, and individualism. And I would argue social entrepreneurship does the same thing. It may have a good intent, but it still has those still, those still, they're in that framework. And they see the community as a resource to be exploited. That we pull value out and we never bring that back in or we pull value out and we walk away. 
And we need to rethink that. So from my perspective, you know, it's, it reassimilates and recolonizes indigenous students and non-indigenous students, right, into kind of dominant Western Eurocentric views and again marginalizes perspectives, indigenous perspectives that generally hold collective values above purely economic ones. So if I think about what indigenous entrepreneurship for, for, for me is, it's around, it involves creating, managing, and developing new ventures by and for indigenous peoples. It's around, it involves acting on and promoting a community's inherent rights and sovereignty through those ventures because we can act on our rights and, and assert sovereignty through the creation of hybrid ventures. And ventures that are responsive to the community the values, the traditions, the culture, and the socioeconomic needs and objectives. And I just put this, I, I will, let's look at this quickly. Entrepreneurship is messy, right? And so I wanted to figure out how do we start thinking about this? So I created this, this, this visual because I think in, in images around indigenous communities and the challenges. So we've got economic development, and community health are tied in. Culture versus development, how do we think about that? Sovereignty, nation to nation, nation within nation, nation, right? Uh, free and power informed consent, non-indigenous versus indigenous partnerships and ventures, right? The individual versus collective and where that kind of sits. So there's a lot that's going on in terms of communities and this was one way to, for me to start thinking about that. So Jeff Korntassel, who wrote a book called Re-Envisioning Research, had said colonization and the false premise that there are no legitimate alternatives to the market system served to weaken the confidence of indigenous people and challenge one's ability to imagine anything other than economic development as a viable pathway to resurgence. And for me, what's important, it's around that it challenges our ability to manage anything other than economic development as that viable pathway to resurgence or revitalization. And that's why I've kind of shifted my frame, right? So what, what, the work that I've been doing lately is around moving from a Eurocentric, individualist, economic-centric, competitive perspective to one that has that balances collective and individual, that has a value-centric component to it, and that focuses on co the whole collaborative component around that. So instead of stressing uh, dog eat dog, you know, uh, the winner takes all is around how do we think that we're all, we, we can all benefit from that. And so for me that began with kind of reframing entrepreneurship as hybrid venture creation. Um, and that begins with the, the, the redefining the term around that notion of value, that, that, that entrepreneurship and hybrid venture creation is around extracting and contrib contributing value grounded in the community's particular conditions, right, the socioeconomic conditions, you know, within which that entrepreneur is actually embedded. We're not outside as entrepreneurs. We're not those heroes working outside. We're actually in that community. We're going to have impact in that community. So what are the potential forms of value? Economic value creation is there. It's important. Social value creation is important. Environmental value creation is important. Spiritual value creation, cultural value creation. These are different kinds of values that can be important that can drive what that hybrid venture looks like. So if we look at value extraction and creation as a kind of a concept, it, it kind of incurs in the context of the social interrelationships and interdependencies of a community. So how does that community function? How does it work? Where is that community? It's influenced by the cultural and spiritual understandings, those beliefs, those practices, and the socioeconomic needs of, of that community. What are those needs? And it's embedded in a particular geographic place, right? In an environmental and a community ecosystem within, that, within which that community is situated and within the, where that venture operates and functions. And so indigenous entrepreneurs are kind of, they're typically guided to hybrid venture creation because for, for a number of reasons, but indigenous identity, uh, what are our values, our tradition, our cultures, and our world views? How does that tie into how we think about what a good business is or what we want to be doing? Community governance and development strategies. How does the community constrain our ability to do certain ventures or promote those? Or how do they point us in different directions, right? What are the key socioeconomic needs, the objectives, but what are the health needs and objectives of the community? You know, where is that community in terms of that? 
and then the orientation and values towards the use of economic development and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures. Not every community is the same, and not all of them are using the same mechanisms to promote um, healthy communities or well-being within their communities. So how do we think about that? And how do we think about that as mechanisms for asserting rights and asserting sovereignty, right? And for promoting self-determination and self-governance. All these things that hybrid ventures can do. So if we just briefly, if we kind of look at it, we're talking about indigeneity, so worldviews, identity, culture, values, tradition, tradition, territory, indigenous rights, so sovereignty, inherent rights, self-governance, and self-determination on this level. Then we're thinking about community development. Where is the community in terms of their own development? How are they organized? Are they organized um, from a traditional governance perspective? Are they Indian Act, non-Indian Act? What does this community look like? Um, what are the socioeconomic objectives? Are they social? Are they cultural? What are those objectives? I framed some out, but there are many more objectives and many more values that can kind of come into play. And then thinking about community embeddedness as a, as a consideration. How embedded is that, that venture in the community? Is it highly embedded? Is it 100% indigenous owned? Is it 100% um, part of the community or not? Right? Or is it, is it low? Is it low because all we do is we get royalties? So we have a venture. Uh, there's another company. No, they're not hiring any people. They're not engaging in our community, but we get in ventures. That's a low kind of venture approach. So if we look at it, what I'm doing is I'm re reframing from a, this kind of Eurocentric where economic value creation is at the top and giving us alternative ways of thinking about what those values can be. So we may want to start a venture that fundamentally the cultural value creation is at the fore. That's how we're going to frame what that venture is about. It's about supporting culture or promoting culture or revitalizing culture. Economics still in there, but it's inside the language of culture that frames the culture. The same with social values. Economics there, but we foreground the social because that's what's important to us. So we may not want to make, we may, we, we want, we may want the uh, organization to be sustainable, but we really may want to just focus on what are the social issues that we need to address? What are the socioeconomic objectives? We may just have companies, it's all about, it's all about economic value creation. That's all we want to do. But we've got these other alternatives when we're thinking about hybrid ventures. So fundamentally, you know, indigenous hybrid ventures adopt a value creation strategy that's responsive to the community and its needs and its objectives. And hybrid ventures can address issues as, as varied as healthcare, poverty, economic development, environmental stewardship, education, housing, culture, all of those components. In a way, what I've tried to do is bring these two together and have a way to how do we start to think about that. Right, so the framework for me is holistic. It considers the context within which entrepreneurship takes place. It recognizes diversity. It recognizes that not all communities are the same. Not all communities have the same kind of value uh, priorities. And so how do we start thinking about that? We, we all don't share the same world views. So how do we think about that from a hybrid venture creation? It's values centric. It's driven by values driven by others that come out of the community and out of, the, uh, out of the, the, the geographical space that we're in. And also, I believe it, it addresses some of our calls to action from an education perspective and from a business perspective. So I, what I want to do is quickly talk about values. And uh, one of the things that I've done is I brought together some work of indigenous scholars globally into this model. And so one is the quadruple bottom line. So the framework is grounded in indigenous perspectives. It seeks to decolonize Western perspectives, and it's premised on the notion that indigenous entrepreneurs are embedded in a community, that they understand that community, they function in that community, and they have any understandings of those values, traditions, and culture. And so this model is a great way to understand the four value creation sub-dimensions and four central dimensions. The ones are community, spirituality, sustainability, and entrepreneurship. And then we've got cultural, social, and economic, and environment nested in. So it's an indigenous scholar talking about how do we start to think about values. Another one is the Maori decision-making framework, which comes out of New Zealand, Kepa Morgan's work. He's a, 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 he's a Maori 
engineer. And he's thinking about how do we start thinking about values from a decision-making perspective or from an assessment perspective when we're looking at our, what, what's important to us and how do we assess issues around that. So he's applied uh, Maori indigenous worldviews and brings Ma Maori into the, the view as a binding force which, within which everything exists. And he's created a model to talk about those values. And again, it recognizes that not all communities are the same. For him, it's around environment, cultural, social, and economic. And so it emphasizes those, those uh, dimensions, and it stresses that these need to be determined by the particular community. It's not something we, we push on to the communities, that that happens through community engagement, much in the way that the Cal University of Calgary strategy came from ground up and had in community engagement all the way through that process. So what I want to talk about very quickly is a couple of examples. So when we're thinking about values and, and, and how we bring some of that in, well, we have the example of the Lax Kualams. They voted against Malaysia's petroleum national bid of $30 billion, this project, in three polls. So they rejected 1.15 billion Canadian package in which each band member would have raised $319,000 um, for the right to build a, a natural gas export terminal. The issue was not money, it was environmental and culture. It was around values. And they worked with the company to change that, and I guess in a, a couple of months ago, they've signed an agreement because those environmental and cultural issues were, were challenged and they were dealt with. Another example is around indigenous rights. And how do we think about uh, how would a hybrid venture function to kind of support that? A great example around that was the Ainu in Japan. In Japan, the Japanese government refused to recognize them as indigenous peoples. They did not want to real. They did not want anybody to be recognized as an indigenous people. But the the Ainu of Japan were indigenous peoples to to both Russia and Japan on the islands. They had a distinct language, culture, and religion, and colonization severely limited that. So their hybrid venture looked at creating museums, cultural centers. But the strategy wasn't about making money. It was to it was around preserving and promoting the culture but also promoting the culture to tourists, promoting the culture to other Aboriginal people or uh, Japanese people in the world because the key was they needed to revive that culture but they needed to define themselves as indigenous peoples in a country that was unwilling to do that. So they created a hybrid venture to do that and 40, 50 years later, the government recognized them in law, which was a significant move. They first recognized them informally and then they did it legally. So big change. And so just to close, when we're thinking about hybrid ventures, I go back to those questions. So what do you think? What is indigenous entrepreneurship? How is entrepreneurship enacted by indigenous peoples? What are your thoughts? And then finally, why think about indigenous entrepreneurship as hybrid venture creation? So that's been my kind of quick hit on that. I've, if you want, there's a chapter that talks about it. And if you want, I'll email that to you. Um, if you'd like to have a look at that, just contact me by email or via LinkedIn. So thank you. I appreciate awesome. that. Fantastic. I think you've, you've shared a ton of information and I saw a bunch of you taking pictures and I told a few of you on the side, you don't have to take the pictures. We're going to load all these slides up. So if you want them, we're going to give them to you. You know, I should have said that <laughs> at the start, but I was just so excited to give the mic away, to be honest. Um, so thank you so much for that. We have now the time that you ask questions and interact. What's indigenous entrepreneurship with those three challenging questions to the people here. So if you else? have a question, just put your hand up and we'll have roving mics. So we'll go there and over here right after. Hello. Um, I was very intrigued by your list of five values. So we've seen an evolution in business from, you know, shareholder values, the only thing that matters. Then we went to double bottom line, then triple bottom line. You've said quadruple, but you actually have five on your list. Is there a reason why you wouldn't want to think about spirituality as one of the bottom lines? Well, what I, what I was doing was, uh, and the reason I pulled that, so no. And so what I would say, the values are driven by the community. They're driven by the community that you're in and a part of. What I wanted to demonstrate was that there were indigenous scholars who are already thinking about that, and they're creating frameworks for us to actually apply that in class. So we can look at that quadruple bottom line and we can think about how do we bring that in class uh, from an indigenous perspective or from a non-indigenous perspective and how do we leverage indigenous scholars work. And it's the same with, the, uh, with uh, Keppel Morgan's work around uh, 
uh, around the Maori decision-making framework because he's got a, a model of decision-making that goes right behind that as well. So there's, I've just given you the, the Coles Notes version around that. So the example that you gave us for a hybrid venture was basically an, an artisanal type of a business, making makla, something traditional. And when I think about uh, indigenous things like uh, artworks, uh, being able to make a totem, something like that, you know, these artisanal type of things that, that sort of reflect culture would seem to be a natural fit for this type of a venture. But does the model work with things that are other types sure does. Of, of ventures Yeah, as yeah, well? and, that, and the only reason, I mean, that's a great point. And so it's hard to kind of figure out how to bring examples in. That's why I brought the Ainu as a way to drive uh, the rights and creation of sovereignty, right? So a hybrid venture can be a venture that happens with, uh, with an oil company, for example. But what it is, is how do we bring indigenous values in? How do we have that conversation around what our rural view is? How do we bring you into what our values are and how we're going to have this venture together, right? And it doesn't mean that, that we won't be having a, a venture that's purely in that economic values framework with culture and social and spirituality inside that. But it may also mean we may reframe that from another perspective, right? But it does go across in that way. So, yeah, those were some examples, but, but it fundamentally goes across different ways of thinking around business. Because we've got the way that, that it's embedded in the community. A low embedded uh, high, uh, indigenous hybrid venture is one where we allow you to work in the community to use our resources and we'll, we'll get a royalty out of that. So it's a hybrid venture, it's resource based, it's royalty based, but then we've got uh, um, uh, the royalties coming in, and then whatever happens with that goes back in the community based on the community, right? So there's a, there's a whole component we didn't talk about was around how do you think about community embeddedness and how does that work from a hybrid venture perspective? So, so there's a component around that. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, my, my question is related to an experience I had many years ago when as a group we uh, were asked by a band council to help them with economic development. And uh, we struggled with the old economic problem of land, labor, and capital. And every time we looked at a, a solution, it seemed to bump up against one of those issues. Uh, for, uh, as an example, one of the, a couple of the initiatives we looked at were uh, on-reserve uh, school busing and on-reserve taxi service. But in each case, we ran, well, what about fu uh, on-reserve fueling? What about on-reserve um, uh, vehicle maintenance and service. The, the, in other words, all the building blocks didn't fit together. And finally, after much work and, and a long, long time, stretching into years, I'm afraid, we hit upon the solution, wild rice. And your comment about Japan reminded me of it because this was a, an industry on the reserve that was large and it, 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 uh, it um, employed most of the working age adults on the reserve and they were, uh, if you will, experts at wild rice right. and ended up uh, um, exporting wild rice to Japan because the Japanese thought it was very exotic. Mm -hmm. But the, I, my question is, in my experience, there wasn't a lack of entrepreneurship. The, the band counselors, they, they just needed they, they needed um, a, a spark, and, and once they had that spark, we, we, we stepped back and watched it go. Well, and I think what you're pointing to is that, from my perspective, it's community-driven. It comes out of the community's understanding, the community's values. And one of the quotes that we kind of went through quickly was around member two and how they frame, frame what they're going to do and how they do development and how they think about economic development right from their values. It starts with their values. In a lot of communities, it's how they focus on where are our values. So it's a great example of kind of thinking about hybrid venture creation. That would be a highly embedded one in terms of the community. Oh, well, th thank you. Th this has been wonderful. And what you've said is very compelling. But it strikes me that one of the challenges um, that you, the project faces is the legal system, which enshrines not just the European view of the world, but an English view of the world. Um, it's conceivable that for business that's conducted entirely within First Nations territory, it's, it would be possible to develop indigenous legal system to conduct it. But in the kind of sort of joint venture 
um, that you've been talking about, isn't it always going to be an issue that at the end of the day, the, the common law of Canada is going to have to... No have question to about it, but also the, 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 how a community is governed, there's no question. And so that's why the, I've kind of pulled that framework together because I want us to start thinking about that and giving us a way to start thinking about that because we have to think about that, right? And so there's no question we're going to bump out of, and we have to function within that, uh, but, but we have to start thinking about that, right? So I think that's a great question, but I don't see that as a constraint. I think that's part of what we're trying to work towards, right?